Good afternoon or good morning. If you're on the West Coast, I'm Ann Greiner, President and CEO of the Primary Care Collaborative, and I want to welcome you to our September webinar, Achieving Comprehensive, Equitable Primary Care, How Risk Adjustment for Medical and Social Complexity Helps. This is our uh, monthly webinar series that is available free of charge to the primary care community, and we're so glad that you could join us today. We have an excellent set of experts who are going to discuss the issues related to adjusting payment for both medical and social complexity. Let me tell you a little bit about the Primary Care Collaborative in case this is your first webinar. We are a nonprofit multi-stakeholder organization based in Washington, D.C., and our sole focus is strengthening primary care as the foundation of a high-performing health system because we know that strong primary care can improve population health outcomes, reduce inequities, and yes, even begin <clears throat> to bend costs. Uh, I am delighted to be discussing this topic. It's um, critical uh, to our work, uh, which is focused on primary care delivery and payment reform. Both are critical and they are intertwined. We're not going to get the kind of uh, delivery uh, system we want unless we reform payment. We have just launched a recent campaign, Better Health Now, that is focused on <clears throat> implementing the payment recommendations in the 2021 National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report. And that report calls for um, models to be risk adjusted for medical and social complexity. So uh, that's really what we're going to be focused on today, discussing data sources and models that are used to identify medical risk and social complexity, their strengths and limitations, and how they can support comprehensive, equitable primary care. Let me um, introduce our three panelists um, and also let you know that this recording will be made available within 48 hours on our website. So if um, a colleague of yours wasn't able to join us today, you can share the webinar with them. Also, we'll be making available in the chat and as part of the um, posting, a number of papers that um, our panelists have authored um, and other resources. Uh, let me get underway by first introducing um, Dr. Rob Saunders. Rob is research, Senior Research Director, Healthcare Transformation at Duke Margolis. And in that role, he oversees a portfolio of payment and delivery reform initiatives. Prior to joining Duke Margolis, uh, Rob was Senior Director and then Senior Advisor to the President of the National Quality Forum. That's uh, where Rob and I first met. Um, prior to that, he was Senior Program Officer at the Institute of Medicine another place where we uh, both worked, although did not overlap, and managed um, healthcare legislative affairs for Representative Rush Holt. He previously served on the Duke University Board of Trustees from 2005 to 2007. And Rob's gonna be talking about um, a wonderful primer that he and others authored about risk adjustment. And um, I would uh, highly recommend it. Uh, Rob will be followed by um, uh, Dr. Tracy Henry, and she is a general internist in the Division of General Medicine and Geriatrics at Emory, Emory University. Uh, she provides primary care to resource poor populations in Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, she's uh, practicing. She's also an attending physician for the inpatient teaching services at Grady Memorial Hospital, an assistant health director and supervising attending in the primary care center. So her um, uh, she combines both um, uh, work as a primary care internist, she does research, and she also is involved in teaching. She's held many leadership roles, and um, we'd be here for some time if I mentioned them all, so I hope you forgive me, Tracy. Um, she was selected as a presidential leadership scholar. Um, she also currently serves on the American College of Physicians National Medical Practice and Quality Committee. She's a delegate to the AMA House of Delegates and an AMA Health Systems Scholar. 
So we're thrilled to have um, Tracy with us today. Her clinical research and academic work really focuses on the social determinants of health and achieving health equity for her patients and populations through innovation. Uh, and last but not least is um, Dr. Uh, Bob Phillips. Many of you recognize Bob. He's been a um, very important contributor to PCC's work for um, some time, and the American Board of Family Medicine um, uh, is a member of the PCC. And that uh, within the uh, American Board of Family Medicine is the Center for, for Professionalism and Value in Healthcare that Bob leads. And that center is focused on creating a space in which patients, health professionals, payers, and policy workers, policy makers, excuse me, can work to renegotiate the social contract. I think we need to have the social contract renegotiated. The center seeks to define value across the healthcare spectrum, how to measure it, how to improve it, how to engage and develop leaders. Um, Bob, uh, was named executive director in 2018. And part of that, he was ABFM vice president for research and policy. Before that, people may have known Bob in his role as director of the Robert Graham Center, a health policy research center in DC. Uh, Bob also practices uh, one day a week in a community-based residency program in Fairfax, Virginia. He's professor of medicine at Georgetown and at Virginia Commonwealth University. Bob also has um, many, many awards and um, attributes, but I do want to say one of the things that um, I think really informs uh, Bob's outlook um, and his passion for the underserved is uh, due to growing up in a rural community that is both a health profession shortage area and also a medically underserved area which is currently served by two rural health clinics. Uh, he also worked in FQHC that was embedded in a federal housing project. So Bob comes to this topic with um, a lot of deep experience. He was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2010 and has served the National Academies in several capacities, including as one of the um, leads on the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine Primary Care Report in 2021. So um, without further ado, let me turn the baton over to Rob uh, to give us a primer on risk adjustment. Rob. Thanks, Anne. And as Anne mentioned, I'm Rob Saunders from the Margold Center at Duke. And my job is to make sure everybody has a, a level playing field, recognizing of the 250 folks on the call right now, some of you may be deeply steeped in risk adjustment, and some of you may understand the basic ideas, but you know, really want to learn a little bit more. So if we jump to the next slide, I'm going to try to cover four topics in our, our time together. Uh, one is really just understanding why do we do risk adjustment in the first place and how are we doing it now, then move on and discuss some of the strengths and weaknesses of the, uh, the current types of methods we use for risk adjustment, talk a little bit about where we're thinking about using social risk factors in those risk adjustment algorithm, and finally highlight some recommendations or some areas where risk adjustment may go in the future, especially as we seek to improve it. So if we jump to the next slide, you know, from first principles, the basic idea of risk adjustment is, was originally designed about avoiding adverse selection or avoiding cherry picking such that if you're expected to take care of a group of people and you're given a set budget per person to do so, your first incentive is to find people whose expenditures will likely be less than that number um, and avoid folks whose numbers, whose expenditures may be greater than that number of uh, budget number that you've been given. Um, and that's really was the initial focus of risk adjustment. And the basic idea how it's been done is looking at historical associations between healthcare spending and specific clinical diagnoses. Um, you know, CMS has a particular system, they call it the HCC system, which looks at uses traditional Medicare claims to, to make those associations. There's other folks that have other types of risk adjustment algorithms out there, and there's nuances to all of this that we could write a whole thesis on, but that's a basic principle. If we jump to the next slide, then, we have to think about how risk assessment plays a role in the move to value that we're seeing right now. So CMS has made a stated goal that they wanna move all of the people 
for whom they pay for health care to some type of accountable care by 2030. As we move folks to more advanced value-based payment models, especially say capitation for primary care, risk adjustment becomes even more important because uh, you'll need to make sure that those benchmarks, those financial benchmarks that you're holding folks to really reflect the and, and really reflect the quality of care and not necessarily reflect the fact that you may have a healthier or sicker population. And we also want to make sure that there's incentives and resources for plans providers to both uh, attract and to retain and to take care of people with higher and more severe healthcare needs. And there's some pretty substantial sums of money that are at play under risk adjustment today. I include a quick example below, um, but the, the key takeaway here is it can move from an individual person, say a 74 year old man, you can move from having say $3,000 uh, if they have no according to diagnoses to almost $18,000 if they have three serious diagnoses and are also duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. So, the risk adjustment numbers are actually pretty substantial. And this leads us to the next slide, which is one of the questions that we're asking about uh, now, which is does risk adjustment actually improve value or support that move to value? On the one hand, uh, one of the principles of risk adjustment is making sure that you've got accurate and, and a really complete diagnostic history. And that's important for individualized care plans, it's important for population health management, you want to know whether uh, and, and identify all of your, say, diabetic patients that you want to check in on for retinopathy, you need to have an, an accurate um, coding in place. And therefore, the additional funds that come in can be helpful to support those types of population health management, those individual care supports. However, there is a scenario, too, that is in the news and has gotten a lot of attention over the last couple of years which are that the risk assessment system, because it moves a fair bit of funding, creates some pretty strong incentives to focus on coding. And you can see uh, a number of companies and ecosystems that have sprung up that are really focused on getting more diagnosis codes in play. And there's less incentive to do something with that code. Um, it's really about getting the code in the first place, which then triggers a greater sum of money, as opposed to making sure that once that code is in place, that this person's care improves. And this is one of the tensions that we're seeing right now, and one of the tensions that you're probably seeing in the policy debates about risk adjustment, is how do we make sure we're more in scenario one versus two? And if we jump to the next slide, this really ties into the strengths and weaknesses of current risk adjustment. So in general, you know, summarizing a lot of research out there, Risk adjustment has been, algorithms have been reasonably successful in reducing the incentives for adverse selection. They're not to say they're perfect. Um, in fact, the uh, risk adjustment algorithms can underestimate, say, the cost of care for somebody with a, a serious condition relatively substantially, um, but they are at least putting incentives in the right direction and helping to reduce um, the, the proportion of adverse selection. And, one of the things that comes along with risk adjustment has been that it includes a pretty strong incentive for documentation, um, but there's a question of whether the additional funds after the documentation actually do link to better care. Um, and one of the other challenges we have with risk adjustment now is that they really only focus on clinical diagnoses with some very limited exceptions. Um, although there's some other really important factors, say like a person's functional status, socioeconomic factors that can be really strong predictors of health spending, health need, and the like. And this leads really to part of the, the next slide. So one of the focuses now for future risk adjustment is been thinking about how to incorporate social factors in risk adjustment. In addition to the fact that that would make risk adjustment possibly more accurate, it also could advance health equity as we recognize that social drivers of health have a very strong impact on a person's overall health, person's overall health care utilization, and also on the equity um, across the population. Unfortunately, they're rarely included in current risk adjustment models, largely for data reasons, because many risk adjustment models mostly use administrative claims data, and social factors rarely are used there with some very specific exceptions that, uh, with some very specific exceptions. So one of the approaches we're starting to see now is more geographic measures uh, that may be surrogates. Uh, 
that can capture some level of social needs, say for a local community, um, and also can then therefore help identify where there may be social need. And you've got a variety of approaches and indices that can be used for this. This is also the approach that the ACO REACH model by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation are using. Um, they're using the Area Deprivation Index to try to get a sense of taking care of patients who have higher social need. However, if we jump to the next slide, the key takeaway that I want to convey is that while social factors and risk assessment can be important, you want to make sure you do it thoughtfully, because if you don't do it thoughtfully, you can reinforce existing structural inequities. And so I've got two graphs here to demonstrate that. The graph on the left plots every county in America, according to, on the x-axis, the social vulnerability of that county, uh, according to the social vulnerability index. And on the y-axis looks at the percent of folks in that county who report they are in poor fair health. And you see a really strong association there. In fact, almost double the number of people um, in the most vulnerable counties report having poor or fair health than the folks on the far left who are from counties that presumably are higher income, have greater, have fewer social needs. However, we take those same counties and we plot them in the graph on the right and look at their Medicare expenditures. And what you'll notice is there's much less of an association. Um, and part of the reason for that, and, and part of the reason for this disconnect, has a lot to do with uh, lack of access to care. And that lack of access can be due to structural racism, it can be due to structural inequities in care. There's a lot of reasons for those access barriers, but it does mean that folks that have, say, social vulnerabilities all, always have access, and therefore their healthcare utilization may not be as high as it needs to be. They have a lot of social needs, but those may not be being met by the current healthcare system. And if you use the traditional approach to risk adjustment where we plug in variables into a model looking at the past, so looking at the association between that factor and healthcare utilization, you may artificially um, lower the amount of money that is going to populations that may have high social needs. So you have to be very thoughtful about how you use it. If we jump to the next slide, there's some ways that we can improve risk adjustment. So one way would be to pair, uh, you know, incorporating social factors into risk adjustment algorithms with supplemental policies to make sure we're really meeting the needs. We can also think about how we're including other factors that are really important for uh, people's, for capturing people's health, like functional status, like patient reported outcomes into that. And finally, we can make sure that we're using as broad of data as possible and aligning risk adjustment with quality measures to make sure that we're both minimizing data collection, but also aligning incentives to both capture documentation for risk adjustment, but also to improve care. So to conclude, in the next slide, sort of three things to walk, I want you to walk away with. One, risk adjustment is becoming more important, but it's got a fair bit of ways to go to, to really meet health policy goals, especially improving equity. We've got some challenges there um, in terms of how well it can predict and some of the incentives that are it, it leaves, as well as its overall effectiveness. Um, and finally, while there's a lot of interest in incorporating social factors into risk adjustment, we need to be thoughtful about how we do it to make sure we don't bake in existing inequities and recognize that risk adjustment is just one tool. And you're gonna also need to pair risk adjustment with other policies and other supports to improve care for traditionally underserved populations. And this is say the approach you see in the ACO REACH model where in addition to uh, identifying those, those populations with, with, with high area deprivation index, it also increases the amount of funding in order to make up for those access barriers. So with that, let me stop and turn things back over to Ann. Thanks so much, Rob. And I think um, the two slides that really jump out are that, um, you know, that red and green, um, and we want to be in the green so that we're um, getting the value from risk adjustment and not just um, upcoding. And then um, the additional revenue is actually not being put against uh, an expansion of services. And then your other, the scatter plot is also uh, really important that we don't bake in existing inequities by relying on past data. So thank you so much. Um, now we're going to turn to um, Dr. Henry, who's going to give us a sense of what this all means uh, more at the ground level um, as a practicing uh, primary care physician. 
Um, and also would love um, for her to comment, for you to comment, um, Dr. Henry, on you know, where, where should risk adjustment take place and what should primary care be accountable for? Some argue primary care should be accountable for total cost of care, um, obviously including hospitalizations and um, uh, ED use. Others say, no, we should really uh, focus it more on primary care services. So let me turn the baton over to you. Thank you, Ann, and thank you for PCC for having me here today. Uh, so I'd like to begin with an example case that's representative of one of many of my patients that I see in the clinic. Uh, and so she, this is a 50-year-old woman, I'll call her Mary for the sake of this case, with a history of high blood pressure. She has diabetes and heart failure. And so she was admitted into the hospital twice in the past month with a heart failure exacerbation and once for low blood sugars. She is a widower and mother of three and takes care of her aging parents. She works two part-time jobs. She returns to the primary care clinic <clears throat> for a hospital discharge follow-up. Next slide. So what are some of the social drivers that may be affecting Mary's care and her health outcomes? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> well, it's many of the things that we see here on the slide. Uh, for one, it's food insecurity or um, uh, Mary lives in a food desert and um, she prioritizes her family, her aging parent and her children eating. And so Mary's doing what she was uh, told to do by her doctor. She was told to take her insulin. So she's taken her insulin, but because she has low health literacy, she didn't understand that uh, if she's not eating to not take her mealtime insulin, which was causing her to have the low blood sugars <clears throat> and then return back to the emergency department. And then also listed here um, for other reasons, uh, uh, no copay. Uh, she couldn't afford a copay and cost of treatment. And so all of these social drivers that are listed on the slide have led to the uh, poor health outcomes that we see in Mary today. Next slide. So what are some of the issues that are important to address and adapt to primary care? So what we know is that patients that are clinically complex often have more socially complex issues. And those socially complex issues can also lead to higher utilization of healthcare costs. And so I make that point with uh, the small caveat is that when you go back to our patient, Mary, uh, you see that she actually has had many of those uh, clinical risk factors and comorbidities like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure for years, and also uh, many of those social risks that we, and drivers that we uh, mentioned on the slide. But uh, Mary just now started coming into the hospital clinic. And so some of the um, prior social uh, adjustment for risk factors that use claims data will actually underestimate the risk and the cost of care of patients like Mary. And so what we've been seeing, uh, in, at least in our safety net population, is that with these social um, adjustments that we are often are missing the mark when we focus on a single disease or organ system. And so patients like Mary, uh, they have multiple comorbidities, but that one comorbidity, her coming back in with a low blood sugar or with diabetes doesn't tell the entire story. And so how do you tease apart which part of the disease? Is it, was it the heart failure? Was it the diabetes? Was it the hypertension? Or was it all the many other social drivers that have a cumulative effect on our patients and populations and allostatic load, which is sort of that uh, wear and tear on their bodies? And so how do we garner a more complete picture for a patient? And that's really the true question. How do we really account? How can we validate or find studies and measures that can truly account for all of the different things that Mary is experiencing and the examples that we gave on the previous slide? And so we at least have to start with uh, naming the social drivers, being aware of the social drivers as primary care physicians, as clinicians, as providers. We have to uh, document these in our clinical encounters. And I know that gives us a lot of angst because you hear documentation, that's another click, uh, that's a, another measure, that's another thing to learn and triage and track uh, in our clinical encounter, which can also, from a system standpoint, lead to more burnout. But in order to get to the point where we're leveraging our EHR, leveraging our data, our social determinants of health data, which can actually track over time um, the, the levels of social uh, risk and unmet needs for our patients so that we know where uh, the resources uh, to target and how much of those resources that we need. 
And then so you may be thinking, so what about those Z codes that we've been hearing a lot about? So we do use Z codes in my clinical practice. They can be effective if uh, if used, but again, that is another click, you know, whose job is it in the clinical visit? At least with the Z code, anyone that's part of the healthcare team can document those. And Z codes are not exactly exhaustive. Um, <clears throat> and they're not detailed enough to capture many of the social drivers that are actually actionable. Next slide. So how can risk adjustment support safety net hospitals? Well, first of all, we should not penalize physicians and other providers for outcomes outside of our control. And how do we account for differences in quality of care? Is it poor quality of care resulting, resulting from our social drivers or is it care provided by our clinicians? And so we want specific targets to be more predictive, to help us as clinicians identify and proactively provide care for our patients with higher social risk. And then we also uh, have to invest in our infrastructure. And what I mean by that is that we need to take into account the community level factors and individual level risk factors. So we, we listed all those things for Mary on the slide, but what about the community level factors? Uh, how far does Mary live from the, the, the closest pharmacy or the closest store with healthy foods or uh, parks or places where she can uh, walk and um, adhere to some of those um, <clears throat> the prescriptions that we give into the clinical visit? And what we want is to promote bi-directional effective communication through the EHR. And so as we're referring Mary out for resources, we also, if Mary were to go out and to the community, and seek uh, job assistance or seek housing or transportation assistance in the community, those community partners should be able to bi-directionally communicate with us back into the healthcare system as all a part of our risk adjustment. Next slide. And so I'd like to highlight three uh, positions from, this, uh, from the position paper by the American College of Physicians. Uh, and this was published in July, 2022. And then the, the first one is position uh, statement number one. And uh, I wanted to highlight these three because the, the first one basically says total compensation, whether it's hybrid fee-for-service, whether it's global capitated payments, has to be comprehensive enough so that physicians and clinicians and other providers can stay in practice. If we're gonna make that change, if we're gonna to transition to a hybrid system or even a global capitated system, we have to be, uh, the reimbursement has to be comprehensive enough so that we can keep our practices open and also corrects for the under, uh, evalu under evaluation of primary care. And also of a personal note, I think that uh, setting, suddenly shifting from um, to a global capitated payment model in which physicians and other healthcare providers take on the risk may be too disruptive to facilitate uh, the necessary practice changes. And then uh, two other points I'd like to highlight. So position number two is having a valid way to measure the cost of care for our patients. And so we think about our patient, Mary, and we and think about um, Rob's, uh, he mentioned the HCC scoring or risk scoring. They don't truly validate how much it costs to take care of a patient. And in many cases, we uh, underestimate the cost of care, which, um, trickles down to the clinicians and also uh, makes it much harder for us to, to keep our doors open. And then, and then finally, uh, position number six, I would like to highlight, we need interoperability. So again, we as physicians and uh, provider systems, we have to work hand in hand with our public health systems. It's imperative when taking care of patients with um, social risk. And uh, if a patient is receiving public health assistance, if they're uh, able to go out and find work in the community, job placement programs, transportation programs, we should know about it. Next slide. And so practical steps with social justice. A care team, so this is ideally what we, we want to see, is which is a care team who identifies the problem and cares enough to solve it. A care model that breaks down barriers, meeting people where they are in their culture, their geography, their literacy, technology. And then we also want a payment structure that supports the care model without overburdening the care team or creating unnecessary reporting. Next slide. So in summary, if we don't measure social risk, uh, we can't respond or begin to address them. 
we have to keep in mind that we value people over conditions and outcomes over processes. And I repeat that, people over conditions and outcomes over processes. We do need to change the way that we are reimbursing care for our patients in order to truly adjust for those social risks and to have the, the compensation that we need in payment structure and primary care so that we can continue to take care of our patients. Next slide. And so we're not a one size fit all, and we have to consider all the local primary and public health infrastructures. And then finally, we need more than just adjusting for social risk. We really have to go upstream and address those social drivers and why we have the health inequities in healthcare that we see today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, um, Tracy. That was terrific and um, helped us to understand um, that we're not there yet in, in being able to measure all the factors that contribute to a patient's complexity, whether it's uh, medical or social. And I really like your line about valuing people over conditions. You know, I think, and that's what primary care, I think, uh, really tries to do is look at the whole person, not just a particular condition. Um, and also the whole person means not just medical, right? So thanks so much for your remarks and look forward to the conversation. After we hear from um, Dr. Bob Phillips, and Bob's going to um, relay some of the innovation that's going on in this space. Over to you, Bob. Thanks so much, Ann. So our our journey at the, at the center actually started about 17 years ago uh, upon learning that other countries are adjusting payments, um, not just for healthcare, but for so social services based on social risk at the community level. And, and we, we started in this space in developing a deprivation index that could be used for that in the United States. But I'm going to talk specifically about what we started 18 months ago in trying to help our federal agencies, our health agencies, understand um, how what we've learned from other countries could be applied here. And that started with a workshop in January of 2021 that we came away from saying that payments should be adjusted for social determinants of health, but really aiming to resolve patients' social risk and to support community interventions. That it should be proportional to area disadvantage and designed to address social needs, not just reflective of usual related healthcare costs. And I think Rob was getting at this that uh, we shouldn't be gauging our payment adjustment to downstream costs or predicted costs, but rather to need. And that we have geographic small area indices that are created based on patient and population outcomes. And these are really viable, reliable, and sustainable mechanisms for payment adjustment and, and putting more payment into the practices taking care of disadvantaged patients and specifically the area and the social deprivation indices. Next, please. And we came into the next two workshops that took place over the last six months aimed at Medicare and Medicaid specifically with the goals of, of the process reducing burden for providers, for payers, for states, uh, and not relying on the collection of social determinants from individual patients across settings. The second is to reduce gaming of risk adjustment. And that came out of uh, our, our partnership with Rick Gilf Gilfillan and Don Berwick, uh, who had written related articles in health affairs at the same time we did. The third is, again, to titrate funding to address social need, not to reflect costs. And the fourth was to create some accountability mechanisms that really, as Dr. Henry said, are, are focused on outcomes, not processes. Next, please. So the Medicare workshop came first and the Medicaid workshop built on it. They weren't independent, but what we came out of the Medicare workshop uh, last March understanding is that federal agency staff, researchers, uh, clinician organizations, and patient organizations felt that patients often do not trust insurers or healthcare systems to give them uh, the services they need in order to, to give up their social needs, that there's a, a lack of trust there that means that many patients aren't identified. The second is that providers need to adapt their practices to address social needs, either directly or more importantly, Dr. Henry's point, with people in the community and community-based organizations in particular. Uh, 
that the funds flow shouldn't stop at the practice, they should go into the community to meet needs. That it is really hard to collect social determinants from patients, particularly those that are most disadvantaged, that that is the mechanism that we're gonna rely on for adjusting payments. Because those most disadvantaged patients, as, uh, as Rob Saunders was pointing out, often don't come in for care. They don't have adequate access. And so their touches on the system limit the opportunities for us to understand their needs. And their system, their needs are often very fluid. There's also a recognition at the practice level that if you identify social need, you should meet social needs. So there's an ethical obligation. And the lack of adjusted payment means that we don't have resources and that clinicians often wind up burned out. We feel that there should be a titration of payment, not a, a flat threshold above which you get a certain amount and below which you get nothing. That we recognize that people, as Rob showed with the, so, the social vulnerability index, the farther along that index you go, um, the greater the need is. So we should be titrating payment to those more complex patients in order to meet their broader needs. And then accountability means that resources should flow through primary care to community, to community-based organizations, and that we should have mechanisms for capturing that that are low burden. Next, please. So the overlap with the Medicaid workshop was not complete, but it, as I said, it did build on it. And there was a strong feeling there that we should be adjusting payments with a combination of community and individual variables. Community being these small area deprivation disease, individual largely meaning HCC scores or medical complexity scores. And we, we pointed specifically at the new Maryland heart payments model and the, the five year going on six year Massachusetts model for offering templates for how to design social risk adjustment payments and to target it specifically and more accurately. There was a strong feeling out of the Medicaid workshop that community involvement is really essential, that a lot of these community-based organizations don't have the infrastructure uh, for delivery, much less accountability. And so these resources are really critical to them and the partnership with healthcare is, is critical. And that patients and families and even providers need help navigating this. Uh, the Community uh, Care Collaborative of Massachusetts has built a wonderful technological solution for, for that navigation, but few practices have access to it. There's a real need for data interoperability, that if there are data collected in one setting, it's, it's nuts that we would reproduce that and try and collect it in another or not have it in another. We should be able to share data about patients' social risks and potentially their social needs so that we're coordinating that care between health system components. And then lastly, that accountability, again, should be focused on outcomes and not as much on process. And again, the Maryland heart payment model is, is exceptionally good for figuring out the right level of accountability with the least burden. Next, please. And I come back to the social deprivation index and the area deprivation index. Um, and as Dr. Saunders mentioned, the area deprivation index is currently being used for the Maryland heart payment model, which is a CMMI all payer model for ACO reach. And it's been proposed in, in federal reg for the Medicare shared savings plan. And I come to these because they are composite measures of neighborhood socioeconomic disadvantage that have been weighted, uh, selected and weighted in accordance with their ability to predict bad outcomes or disease prevalence. So they are really fit for purpose for what we're trying to achieve. Uh, other indices like the social vulnerability, vulnerability index uh, are not fit for purpose because they were designed for a completely different purpose in, in, in the case of SVI to help emergency response planning. And they were developed by consensus. They were not tested for their fit. They were not tested for collinearity and therefore uh, sometimes wind up um, misidentifying communities in a way that ADI and SDI do not. Uh, I'm not saying those are perfect, but they are fit for purpose now until we develop better ones. And uh, I think their use in current CMS, CMMI models is a good indication that the faith is rising, that they are uh, useful. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Bob, and uh, please uh, welcome back our other panelists. And as they're returning, um, clearly, um, you know, 
we're, we're uh, in a phase of innovation when it comes to figuring out how to adjust payment so it really does um, capture all of the different factors that you all have um, lifted up for the audience today. But what are some um, safeguards um, that we might look to as we're uh, you know, going through this period of, of um, moving from fee-for-service to value-based payment to protect um, patients um, and practices. Are there any, any things that we can do to, um, any guardrails, any ways we can um, help during this period of adjustment? And I would say have patients at the table. Yeah, have patients at the table uh, as we're developing these guardrails, as, as we're figuring out how to truly adjust and account for complete cost of care of patients, uh, hearing from them directly of what matters to them most, because we often try to address what we think is important uh, to patients, but may not be meaningfully uh, important to them. And so having them at the table, I, I would say is key. And I, I agree with Dr. Super. Henry and, and think about the example you raised that of, of Mary that, you know, being able to look at, did we change the course of somebody's care? Is care meaningfully different for Mary or people like Mary um, as a result of how we're doing? And I think one of the other big challenges here is it's going to always be, risk adjustment is always going to be a balancing act in some ways. So, you know, we also recognize under the current risk adjustment uh, approaches, which really focus on clinical need, that that can be very helpful for people who have severe clinical need and may have less uh, social need uh, factors. And so one of the, the challenges is gonna be watching how do we make sure that we don't move resources, say, away from folks who have very high clinical need. Um, and because clearly we want to, to do both, where we want resources to go to folks with clinical need and to, to people with the social need, and of course, to people that have both at the same time. Um, so I think there's gonna be a balancing act of this whole time of implementation. And I, I Bob, go ahead. I think you wanted yeah. to weigh in. I completely endorse both of those ideas. Um, I, I would, moving upstream, I think one of the things that Maryland has done well is, is create care transformation teams that help practices understand how do we use these resources. Um, you know, there are practices in Maryland that have gotten half million dollar checks in the first quarter and have no idea how they're supposed to spend those dollars. Um, but these care transformation teams can help them understand about hiring community health workers or social workers to help meet patients' needs. And then the other is a kind of a technological solution that I mentioned Community Care Collaborative of Massachusetts, where they built it technological platform that helps basically refer patients out to community-based organizations uh, and for the community-based organizations to affirm that they have delivered those services to, to finish the cycle. So I think practices need both of those. So I think, Bob, what you're saying is um, support or um, I don't know if it's a learning community or it's technical, um, more individualized support to figure out, um, okay, what additional services might we offer to meet these needs and what would the care team need to look like? But then beyond the clinic doors, um, how do you best interface with community-based services? Um, what's the, I, I remember that um, Dr. Henry brought up the uh, bi-directional communications flow so that um, if, if things are happening in the community, they can be um, uh, coordinated and, and fed back to the practice and vice versa. Um, two really important observations. Anybody else wanna add anything? We'll go on to the next question. Uh, one of the questions that came in and we're getting um, lots, so I think people are really engaged in this topic is much of what we discussed today seems to focus on adults um, who obviously uh, are more likely to have um, intensive um, uh, uh, clinical issues, um, uh, but kids, you know, some do as well, but also children grow up in communities that where there's a lot of social risk. So are the models that you're describing, they also, do they also apply to kids and what is the state of um, risk adjustment for um, payments that relate to pediatrics? 
Maybe I'll start. So uh, first off, would 100% uh, agree that much of uh, we've been talking about has been uh, based on adult experiences, it's been based on adult data. Um, for a wide variety of reasons, there's been a little bit less done for kids, although I think we're seeing that change. So for instance, CMS has the integrated care for kids model that it launched in a number of states and uh, Duke's home state of North Carolina is one of those ink states. Um, and, and part of that is developing alternative payment models that are useful for uh, help, helping improve children's care and, and also meeting uh, children's social needs, which look a, a little bit different uh, than how we would think about this from an adult perspective, because we would probably attach more of a developmental perspective here and think about relationship to schools, kindergarten readiness, and the like. Um, so I, I, I'd say the, the big picture that I would take away, and I appreciate Bob and uh, Dr. Henry's thoughts on this as well, is you know, I think the, that children are uh, starting to be more included in some of these risk adjustment models. We're not quite at the same level we are, and our understanding and science is probably not the same level that we are with adults. Um, and in general, the alternative payment model and, and population-based payment model approaches maybe a little bit earlier in, in process than we are with some of our adult populations. Okay, and I don't know, Bob, if your Medicaid um, roundtable um, discussed um, the uh, pediatric population at all or is really mostly focused on adults within Medicaid. No, actually, the, the case that we used, um, one of the cases that we used was specifically about, about kids. Um, it didn't necessarily change the group's thinking about deprivation indices, although I'll, I'll freely admit that a lot of the work done with these have not involved children's health outcomes. Um, and some of the issues are still the same, like housing stability and food insecurity. Uh, but you, with, with kids, you, um, not that there are more kids in rural areas, it brings up other issues that affect children um, and, and Medicaid. And, and you, you have to start thinking about how does this translate to a rural model as well? And how do you deal with, with children in rural areas and, and the kind the lack of community-based organizations? So the, it did bring up some of the infrastructure issue that may be needed and need to be supported. Super. Um, perhaps you can describe a little bit about um, uh, what's in these um, indices, Bob, that you mentioned, and um, uh, you know how are they how are they constructed, and then where does the you know if, if this if these models are being um, adopted by states and um, CMS is considering them. You know where does the adjustment take place, and and how do um, clinicians, you know, sort of have a window into what that looks like? So, uh, social deprivation index is an eleven-factor index, and uh, area deprivation index has seventeen. What they've what they've largely done is taken uh, data available from census. Uh, with the goal of getting down to as small a geography as you can without losing those, and then looking to see which of those elements and to what degree each of them helps explain particular health outcomes. So some of them have been uh, developed to look at mortality. Some of them have been looked at prevalence of diabetes. Some of them have been looked at uh, unnecessary hospitalization rates. And it turns out when, um, at least for these two indices, when they were geared to those particular outcomes, when you start to look at other outcomes, there are also good correlations. So um, they were really designed to help explain health inequities. In terms of uh, adjustments for payments, at, at least how CMMI has, has done it in their demonstration projects, it tends to be a mixture of, you know, who's, at the, who's in the worst of the worst quartile of area deprivation index and who's in the worst quintile of complex health conditions. And if you meet both of those criteria, then you cross the threshold uh, for which there's payment. Um, those payments were not necessarily geared towards what is the expected cost and how do we recoup that 
and invested up front, at least not for uh, Maryland heart payments. But if you look at Massachusetts, with their model, it was very much geared to downstream costs and how do we try and recoup it. And they lean much less heavily on the, on the small area deprivation index. So I, this hasn't quite sorted itself out yet, um, and, but we have some good test cases. And there was a follow-on to your question, Ann, that I didn't get to. Well, why don't I see if any of our colleagues uh, want to respond to what you just said? I, I, I think I threw too many things at you at the same time. Tracy or Rob? Any observations or comments on what um, Bob just talked about? I know that this is these are brand new indices that are just you know beginning to be used, but I'm wondering if you have any observations. Yes, uh, my observations is that uh, I think these it's awesome that we have another way of looking at how to um, adjust for social risk. I would say that um, looking at geographic data I think gets us closer, but it perhaps uh, actually misses perhaps some of the individual level data, but I do think we are moving in the right direction in terms of innovation. And I, I agree with Dr. Henry, um, and, and some of the work that we've started doing has looked at different types of payment reforms for the safety net, uh, and, and one of the things that we've heard from some of our organizations that we talked to are that a the current models are dramatically underestimating uh, oftentimes risk and you know there's some face validity where you'll see a safety net organization that has an HCC score of 0.7 where one is considered the average 0.7 would be a very healthy population um, and if you go into their clinic you would understand that actually that should be much much higher um, but the struggle can be that the geographic indices are a surrogate um, and so that's helpful to use them because they're less gameable, we have the data now, um, but if they're hard, they're still a surrogate. Um, and so there can be some challenges, like let's say you've got a safety net clinic in a very urban area that has a lot of people, it can look like on paper, they're serving a very well-off population because they're, let's say in New York City and in and, and, and a very high income area of New York City, and yet the people that come in their doors actually have a lot of social need. And I think that's, uh, again, going to our balancing point. Um, you're probably not gonna be able to get everything from any of these approaches. It's always gonna be a balance of, can we, as Dr. Henry noted, you know, pull from Z score, uh, Z codes, or other types of individual level data to make sure that you know, this all balances, given that we don't have perfect data uh, and, and that we're all still learning about what, where risk is based on the, the data that we do have. And actually, Rob, you just mentioned Z codes, and that was a question um, uh, one of our participants had, is whether or not they're currently being used in risk adjustment. And I'm happy to start, and I know, Dr. Henry, you mentioned Z codes in, in your presentation as well. As, as far as I know, but I'd be happy to be corrected here, I don't believe they're being actively used at this moment in, a, in an algorithm that I know of. Um, I know there's a lot of interest. I think part of the challenge is that they're just being so inconsistently used at this point. Um, and there's a handful of places that are actively coding, but as, as Dr. Henry said, you know, it's it's more clicks. We're already doing a lot of clicks. Um, so it's a little <laughs> bit of a, a challenge to, to, to asking folks to do more. But Dr. Henry, do you have thoughts here too? Right, yeah, it's um, not to my knowledge that we're using Z codes uh, in any risk adjustment models as of yet. Uh, just to your point, uh, we know from a few years ago, CMS uh, surveyed and did a study and it was a very small percentage, less than 5% maybe, I don't remember exact numbers, there were uh, of providers actually using Z codes. And so here lies the problem. It's, you know, it's the barriers are the more clicks, there's more things to do in the clinical visit but they are necessary in order for us to uh, start documenting some of those social drivers so that we can uh, localize resources and, and target to specific areas. Yeah, Terrific. I think, Bob. I think, yeah, I think Z codes will be important um, for the reason that, that Rob is mentioning that you have people who live in wealthier areas won't be identified as being at risk um, and they are more specific to people's social needs. Um, but 
but I think the, the difficulty I see in using them at the heart of payment is it becomes another, I'll pay you next year for the problems you identify today. And the mm -hmm. second is for your patients who are most at risk, you may not see them to collect their Z codes, um, or you may not, um, you may know that they have a home, home today, but they don't have one tomorrow. So it's really helpful to have those resources up front and really weighted for the population risk that you have so that when you identify it, you can solve it. Thank you. Well, um, please join me in thanking this uh, terrific set of panelists. I think you've raised um, some of the uh, fabulous innovations that are going on to address this very thorny problem about how do we adjust patient, not only pay, um, payments, not only for medical risk, but also, also social risk. Clearly, we have a ways to go, and we're going to likely be in this period of transition of testing models and getting more data in and figuring out how to make it not so onerous on practices and um, more accurate and, and um, valid. Um, please uh, join me in thanking um, all of you and we look forward to next month's webinar. Also uh, would like uh, to have you all mark your calendars. The Primary Care Collaborative's annual meeting uh, and conference will be on December 14th and 15th, and you will all soon be getting information about that. I hope you can join us in Washington, D.C. It will be the first time in three years that we'll be together in person. So thank you again. I'll look for this uh, webinar to be posted uh, within 48 hours and likely sooner. And um, please uh, do avail yourselves of the materials. Uh, some terrific uh, insights here and um, I think we can all feel very comforted that we've got such dedicated, committed, and um, really passionate folks working on these uh, working on this issue. Have a good afternoon.